welcome to satsang. So the subject of uh, death has been prevalent uh, of late with regards to the corona epidemic and uh, it's clear that a lot of people aren't really ready for death. They're struggling and for the mystic the approach is to be finished with everything in every given moment so there is nothing that needs to be done. Everything that needed to be said has been said. Everything that's needed to be finished is finished. And so if death comes, there's no struggle. There's nothing that needs to happen. There's no racing around. It's all over. And this requires living in the moment rather than living in the future because people who live in the future well in their projections to the future always think they have time to do things later and so they tend to postpone everything if you know that you're impermanent if you know that you're going to die say you've only got one hour left have you finished everything? Have you said goodbye to everybody? Is there any unfinished business whatsoever in your life? Because if you're lucky, you may have an hour when you're dying to actually finish things. Or you might just die suddenly. But the thing about dying is if we can die in a restful, relaxed state, finished with everything, there's a chance of awakening in that moment. But if we're still panicking to finish business, to get things done, if we're still stressing out, all of those desires that are unfulfilled will bring us back into another cycle of samsara birth, life, suffering, and death. And so are you ready? If you had an hour left to live, what haven't you finished? What haven't you said? What haven't you done? Sometimes you hear me talk about I'm willing to die right now because everything's complete. I don't have anything to say to anybody. I don't have anything to worry about. It's all done. It's always all done. Whatever I have said is the last thing I'm going to say to someone. And so then you start to look at, well, with life, we only had so many minutes, each of us have only so many minutes. This is time. And during that time that we had so many minutes, did we do something precious with those minutes? Or did we waste those minutes? Because minutes are like dollars. We get so many dollars. We get so many minutes. Have we wasted the dollars of our life? Or have we spent them wisely? And then you have to look at, well, what does it mean to spend time wisely? What does it mean to spend our seconds wisely, our dollars wisely? What can we spend our money on that is precious? What can we spend our time on that is precious? And I was fortunate enough when I turned 33 to realize that I'd wasted 33 years of my life spending my time on collecting wealth, on being successful in the material world. And I look back at that and I could see that it was quite hollow, that those things that I'd collected weren't truly precious. 
It wasn't until I realized what was precious, and that is love, that I recognized I'd truly wasted 33 years of my life. Now, if you are serving love instead of serving yourself, if you're serving love, then you find that those precious minutes, those dollars you have to spend, are actually spent on loving other human beings. And this shows up in service, in helping people, in helping the planet, in helping plants, in helping animals. Those moments that are spent serving love are the precious moments. All the other moments are a waste of dollars, a waste of seconds. And so you've got an hour left to live and you do a summary of your life. How many precious moments have you had? And how many moments or minutes have you just wasted on what worry, trying to scrounge to get another dollar, on selfishness? How many dollars have you wasted? Because you only had so many and you've got so few left now. Because time is counting down, you're dying. What is your life? been? Has it been one where it's full of precious moments or is it just full of wasted dollars? Because at the age of 33, even though I had been physically very successful, I felt like I was bankrupt because I knew that I didn't have love. I knew I didn't have true heart. I'd wasted my precious moments, 33 years of them. And I didn't know how many I had left. And no one does, no one really knows. How many moments you have left, how many minutes you have left, how many dollars you have left to spend. Have you finished? Are you ready to go right now? Because you, it could be now. Someone could suffer an embolism or a heart attack right now. Have you prepared yourself for now? Have you accumulated those precious moments that come from serving heart, serving love? Or is there a whole pile of stuff you haven't done, a whole pile of stresses, a whole pile of worries that you're going to now can contemplate until that moment comes when it all gets taken away and you've got stuck with a whole pile of desires that are going to drag you back into another life. Have you wasted your minutes? The mystic prepares him or herself for death. That's part of being the mystic. Are you ready? Or are you not ready? And what have you done? What have you done with your precious moments? Are any of them precious? These are questions the mystic or the seeker has to ask themselves. Because we are all terminal. We're all going to die. Have we prepared ourselves for it? Or are we going to be a mess when it comes to our time? that'll drag us back into another life of suffering. The way to live this life beautifully, the way to live this life where every moment is precious, is the way of the heart. Not the way of selfishness, not the way of self-obsession, but the way of the heart. And that's up to you because you create your reality. Nobody creates it for you. You create it. You are 100% responsible for what you're like. Nobody else. Just you. So take infantry. Have a look. See. 
Have you wasted all your dollars? Have you wasted all your moments? Or have you collected precious things? Because every good deed, every loving act is precious. Are you ready for death? Or have you not finished? Are you going to struggle? Are you going to panic? Because no matter what you do, you are going to die. Everybody here is terminal. It's best to get ready now. Rather than be shocked. The way of the heart is the way to go. It's beautiful. It's just inconvenient, but it's beautiful. Selfishness isn't so inconvenient, but it's not beautiful. And it's up to you. Not up to anyone else, not up to what other people are doing. It's up to what you're doing, what you're doing inside of yourself. What do you serve? How do you take care of your precious minutes? Does anyone have any questions or any statements or any challenges to this teaching here today on the subject of impermanence and preparation for death? Hello. Hello. I found it interesting. You kept saying minutes throughout the teaching, not hours, days, years, but minutes. You only have minutes. People don't realize it. You're allotted so many minutes, like you're allotted so many dollars, and you can only spend those dollars. You can't get any more. You can't get any more minutes. And you're all running out of minutes. You're all running out of dollars because time is passing. What are you doing with those precious minutes? What are you doing with those precious dollars? Yeah, I'm planning a future that's not even real. So, good teaching for me, thank you. Okay. Hello. Hi there. Um, I just had a lot of gratitude this morning for the teaching on impermanence. Um, it just, uh, there's, that it, it, it's just now. It just leaves me with now. There is nothing else. That that just happens to be that, that just happens to be true. There is nothing but now. Everything else is a dream. There is only yeah. this moment. This is it. Yeah. I'm just uh, yeah grateful for reality. And when when I get lost. Um, I'm um, not with reality, and death is reality. Thank you. Okay. That was really beautiful. Um, it was really nice to reflect on um, uh, the minutes and which ones were precious and which ones weren't. And when I was looking on it, the ones that were precious that came up for me, I was in the heart. It was generally around kids or loved ones. And then the ones that weren't, they were when I was definitely in my mind. Um, yeah, so it was a really good thing to see. I imagine looking back, and seeing that all your precious moments were spent on worrying, on fear. What a waste of minutes, what a waste of time, what a waste. Yeah, it really is. Um, especially when you, you say it like you have. Um, yeah, it was a good realisation. Yeah, I'm grateful for that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, what came up for me was the feeling that if I was to die in the next hour, I haven't made peace with my brother. Ah. Then make peace with your brother. You don't actually have to make peace with your brother as a physical thing. You can do it in your own mind by accepting what is. We can finish all our business without saying hello to another person, simply through the practice of accepting what is. That's really good, because I couldn't see how, how to open the communication with him. So if I can do it on my own, it's much better. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you accept that you don't know how to open communication? And you accept that you'll never see him again, and it's actually okay. That it's all okay. And something else also that came up was something I haven't explored is being wealthy. And for you, it's something you've done and you've, you've dealt with, you've seen the holiness of it, but there's still a curiosity for me. What is it like to have everything you want? basically, to be able to afford everything you want. There's only one wealth on this planet that is worth anything, and that is heart. If you have heart, you are a wealthy human being. If you do not have heart, no matter how much money you have, or land you have, or businesses you have, if you do not have heart, you are broke. Thank you. Love is the true wealth. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed the discourse. Um, every time I hear like a discourse like that, it just seems so obvious and so oh, it saddens me that I lose touch with that so regularly and just get caught up in things that don't really matter and selfish pursuits. So... Hello, Vishnu. Is it possible to not worry about dying, but not worry about living in the present moment either? <laughs> that sounds like a double banger question that has no solution, but there is a solution. Don't worry. <laughs> Be happy. <laughs> Isn't there a song? Don't worry, be, <laughs> don't worry, be happy. It's a reggae song, isn't it? It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah, I don't know, but it's just, there's no value in worrying. It doesn't get you any taller, as Francis of Assisi stated. Not even one inch. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
because we're conditioned to resist. Yeah, that's right. You're conditioned to resist. It's your natural state. But because we are intelligent, we can learn not to. The same as we can learn not to worry because we're intelligent. And we learn not to resist and not to worry by practicing not worrying and by practicing not resisting. Worry itself is resistance anyway. It's a form of suffering. We create our own reality by the way we think. People who suffer create their own suffering because they resist life. They don't accept life. They resist it. But they don't usually want to own up to that. They want to blame something for their suffering. They want to blame someone or a situation or even themselves. But they don't want to actually realize and take responsibility that they make themselves suffer through their own resistance to what is. You see, the, the, the thing about higher consciousness or spirituality is it's about reclaiming reality from the dream that we've been lost in because we got programmed at school to live in our heads. Meditation is the antidote. Meditation brings us back to reality. It helps us reclaim reality from the dream that we found we're lost in, the matrix that we're lost in. But of course, if you don't meditate, if you don't practice something different than just living in your head, well, you will live in your head projecting and analyzing until you die. It won't change. So the, my notion that life is suffering, I mean, this is samsara, so it is suffering. Is that not reality? Or is that just a thought in my head or just conditioning? Take away your resistance to life and where is the suffering? It's not that life is not uncomfortable and painful from time to time, but suffering only really occurs when we resist. Not because of life, but because we resist. And who's in control of our resistance? We are. We can learn to live in a life of acceptance doesn't mean that we're not going to be effective. We can still approach things and change things from a place of openness rather than a place of closeness, rather than a place of resistance, if we want. But we have to train ourselves to do that because we've all been trained to operate from resistance. We've all been trained to program and programmed to operate from suffering. Life is just the way life is. You can choose to suffer or you can choose not to. Your choice. But do I really get to choose? Well, you know, considering the eye is not real, I, pro I suppose not. <laughs> Here's the thing, you are running true to programs that were put on into you externally. All of your programs have been put into you externally, yet you claim that you are choosing. Well, truly, if you were choosing, you would have put the programs in that you're choosing. But you're running true to patterning that you never put in. So when, whether you have choice or not sounds like maybe not. But here you are in a mystery school that is reprogramming or unprogramming, deprogramming you, if you like. And so you can actually, instead of suffering, stop resisting with the new program and have a nicer life. Your choice. You can take the programming on or not take the programming on. My job in a lot of ways is to convince you to take the programming on so you can stop suffering, stop resisting. But it's going to be your, you're going to create your reality. I'm not going to create it for you. I'm just offering and showing a different way to live. A way towards higher consciousness, a way towards enlightenment. It's up to you whether you take it on. And in that, I don't even know if you have a choice. Yeah. It might rely on how good a salesman I am. 
Oh, that'd be a shame. <laughs> but it still always comes back to your willingness. I can't do it for you. I wish I could, but I can't. I don't like to see people suffering, but I see them insisting on suffering. I see them insisting on resisting life when they don't need to. <laughs> oh, what a game. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hey, Bish. Um, when you say you finished your business with everyone you interact with, does that mean that you've loved them in that interaction? Uh, is that, is, what do you mean by finished business? I have people? no, I have no future. Um, so if I've said goodbye to you, from my perspective, that's the end in that moment. And if I was to die in the next moment, there would be no regrets. That whatever I had said, whatever I had done, was what was meant to be said, was meant to be done. There was no mistakes. Everything is perfect. Everything is complete. It is over. So even if you, for example, had promised someone that you'd do something, you, you still have an acceptance that it wasn't meant to be done if you died in that moment. I'll go one step further. I wouldn't even think about it. <laughs> I don't live in my head. I live in reality. I don't live in dream. You know, up until the age of four, you didn't live in dream either. You lived in reality. You were present to what was happening around you. You weren't thinking about what was happening around you. You were present to it. And then you went to school and you learnt to live in your head and you've lived in your head ever since. Nasty place to live. Because you were never programmed to be happy. You were programmed maybe to be efficient, but never happy. Meditation or getting back to reality, which is what meditation is, affords you freedom from at least that nightmare. You just you have this radical acceptance of what is radical. Is that it's yeah. not it's, it's not radical. It's total. Radical's different. Radi radical sounds like I'm a rebel of some kind. I'm not a rebel. At you are. No, the only rebellion I've got going is the one against my own mind that wants me to suffer. <laughs> and that too. But was that a gradual process of deprogramming, or was that you just woke up one day and it was it was that was it? No, it took forty years. It took a long time because my original teachers weren't very good, but they gave me the clues and I worked on it. I started deprogramming myself when I was 19 years old. I started removing patterns that were what I considered in those days failure patterns, belief systems that were detrimental to myself. Uh, worry was one of the first ones I removed. It took a few years to take it out. Okay. One that I removed at the same time was victim oriented thinking because I could see clearly that there's no such thing as a victim, only people who volunteer to be victims. Bad things happen to all of us, things go wrong for all of us. We can choose or volunteer to be a victim or not, our choice. I see life, this is just as it is, not, I'm not a victim. And I got into that when I was 19. And I got into getting rid of worry when I was 19. And so I haven't had a great deal of suffering in this life because I haven't been a victim of life and I haven't been a worrier. Now, how much is that worth? Because I'm now 66. That's 47 years of a hell of a lot of less pain than a lot of people produce for themselves. Yeah. Because every time you turn yourself into a victim, you suffer. Every time you worry, you suffer. We're not talking enlightenment here. We're simply talking about removing programs that are detrimental to us. But the, you can only do that if you work on doing it. It doesn't happen because you think it's a good idea. It happens because you do you practice. 
insight is just an invitation to do the work. It's not the answer. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Hello, yes. You mentioned the possibility of uh, waking up in the moment of death. Yes. Is that only possible if the mind is already prepared for that? Yes. The mind has to be completely relaxed. It can't be stressing out, it can't be worrying, it can't be concerned about unfinished business. It has to be in a relaxed state. You've spoken about um, you've always been ready, like somewhat ready for death, as in you didn't expect to live because you'd lived such a dangerous life. Um, Does that mean you've always had a certain level of acceptance of death throughout your whole life? Uh, yes, ever since I was a teenager, because I was involved in um, dangerous sports. And if I wasn't willing to die, I probably couldn't have been involved in those sports, because they were dangerous to the level where I could have died at any moment. And so I got used to the idea of dying. I got used to the idea of death. And um, the fear of death started to drop away because I became used to it. And not having the fear of death allowed me to do so many adventures because most people don't do adventures because they're too frightened of the possible consequences. And so instead of having fun, they serve fear. And if you truly serve fear, you stay at home. <laughs> you don't do anything. Because fear is our major defense system for the survival of us as a human and as a species. It's our main main defense system. But unfortunately, if we serve it totally, we don't do anything. I started to become unwilling to serve fear when I was a teenager because I could see that it limited possibilities of living. And the other thing, people who operate out of fear tend to go into severity when they're frightened. And the moment we go into severity, we've cut ourselves off from our hearts and we become capable of any kind of brutal act. Hello. Um, I see the, the importance of getting your house in order. Um, could you have an endless amounts of things to do and I'd say the world is chaos so how can you really get your house in order? Be in acceptance while you're getting it in order of its disorder. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Why was it important for you to have your house in order? Because I was going to die. And I, I knew it. I haven't expected to live past the, the period of one year since I was 20, or even before. I've lived a life that has been full of adventures, full of dangerous journeys, full of extreme sports, and I never expected to live to 66. I always thought I'd be dead within the year. And so, I had to keep my house in order. I had to finish my business so I could die in peace. Could you speak to um, intention upon dying? Intention? What value, yeah, to, to whether it be the intent to have house in order, the intent to... Um, Resolve, um, re release. Okay, so so say you're say you're leaving leaving the country you live in, say it's Australia, and you're going to live in London, and you're going away for ten years or twenty years, or more. Maybe you're going away for a lifetime. 
what are you going to leave behind? What disorder are you going to leave before you leave Australia to go to your new place? Don't you finish everything? Don't you put everything in order so there's nothing left? And so you talk to me about intention. Who wants to leave a mess behind? Who wants to be concerned and worried at the time of death? Yet so many people do not put their house in order, do not finish their business, and death surprises them, and they're unready for it. They haven't prepared themselves for death. So are you saying that to um, is it um, to carry the desire for preparation of death? No, I, I'm not suggesting or you, are you saying even that's too much. Carry nothing. Yeah. Go empty handed. <laughs> <laughs> you can't take anything with you. To prepare yourself for death, you have to be nothing. Because there's nothing you can take with you. Nothing. Not even a belief system, not even an ideal, let alone things. So intent, not so much around um, things or... Um, Stuff, but intent around um, uh, what you've carried in your heart. Um, you see, there's this mistaken. What supports? There's this mistaken yeah. belief that we are the mind and that we are our thoughts, and so people want to take some thought with them. No, we are not the mind. We are not the thoughts. We are that that is aware, pure consciousness aware. And it doesn't need any thought. It doesn't need to take any. You come naked. You leave everything at the door. You don't bring any ideas, any desires, any intentions. You come naked. And then you can be free. And then samsara can be over. If awareness finds itself at that point, that's the end of samsara for you. But for awareness to find itself at that point, you can't be loaded up with ideas, beliefs, desires, intentions. You have to come naked. Um, there are some texts that talk about um, the intent that you carry upon your death is... Um, what supports you in your next life? <laughs> what if you don't want no. one? What if you're not coming back? You see, any intention that you have will bring you back. Because it's a desire. Yeah, so, so um, you're speaking about the um, possibility of waking up upon dying. Freedom. And so... To relinquish all everything everything when you when you describe death the way you do it sounds so freeing and so peaceful but there's still that little bit of fear that just the thought invokes is that and i totally believe in rebirth but why do you think that arises? Is it because even though I believe in rebirth, so I know it's not permanent, in a way it still is? Yeah, because you're not, you're not willing to enter the unknown. You're still trying to control. And if you want to enter nirvana, you can't be into controlling. You have to enter the unknown with a willingness to enter the unknown, which means no control. 
the truth is everybody's in the unknown every moment. They just don't realize it because of their projections. They think their projections are real, but there's nothing real about your projections. Nothing. So why is it so hard to let go? Because I know that. No, no you think you know it. If you really okay. knew it, you would let go. You see, yeah. knowing can be this deep or it can be 5,000 feet deep. Right. But people who know it a few inches think they know everything. They don't recognize that there's 5,000 feet more of knowing. Because yeah. if you really know, you surrender unconditionally. Yeah. Which is actually a non-doing. <laughs> In other words, you don't do anything. <laughs> no reaction. This is the problem with spiritual teaching. People listen to a spiritual teacher or read spiritual texts and they think they know because they've read it. But they only know a little bit. They know a little tiny bit. And there's 5,000 feet more of knowing before they really know. But now they're arrogant because they think they know. So now they've ruled themselves out of the game of higher consciousness because they think they know. You have to always become as a beginner not as someone who thinks he's ahead. Always as a beginner. Always as a beginner. Always less than. Never more than. But death is one of those things that you can only really, what well, most things you can only really know through experience. But death is just one of those things that once you experience it, there's no knowing. Is there? Like once you're dead, you're dead. Like you say, you don't take the thoughts, you don't take the intentions. It's nothing. It's just this letting go of everything. So when you die, let me know. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> that's, that's our whole point. There's no way to know or let anybody know. When you surrender the ego, when it's surrendered completely, you are dead. You're dead as an eye. It's gone. It's gone. And when awareness becomes aware of itself, it's beyond. It's gate, gate, paragate, gone, gone, gone beyond. And there is no death. The ego may die. The body may die. But the mm -hmm. pure awareness and consciousness that we are cannot die. But that's not personal. And this is where a lot of people get caught. They want it to be personal because the ego wants to survive in the personal. There is no personal in beingness. The personal belongs to the I, which is not real. Without your imagination, the I doesn't exist. But somehow you think it's real. But it's not real. We are pure awareness. We are pure awareness, pure consciousness. And we are always here. But not as an I, not as personal. I get it. You know, it's not pure consciousness. There's no... It's just beingness. But then you get a rebirth and you have these past life regressions and then you're remembering stuff. So if it's not, I'm totally confused on this. Um, so if it's not, it's just nothingness. How do you have past life regressions? How do you bring that condition in into another life? Look, if it's true that you can remember your past lives through regression therapy, if it's true, you would never ever want to come back here again once you remembered your past lives because all lives are the same. There's birth, there's suffering which is life and then there's death. And if you live long enough you lose everything you've got again. If you truly remember your past lives you don't have much interest in coming back. You have every interest in the world in getting free of samsara. Well, that would make sense. <laughs> I try. I try not to make sense too often. <laughs> you know what I mean. 
Thank you. <laughs> See, people think that they remember past lives and they had these wonderful lives where they had children and they had castles and they had all these things. And No, that's just your imagination. What we remember from past lives is the highlights. And the highlights are all the traumatic, the tra traumatic events. It's not, it, it's not brilliant. We remember the suffering. We remember the dying. We remember the loss. We remember, and we don't want to do it again. So if we must be here, the way of the heart is the way to make it beautiful to be here. It is called the beauty way because it's beautiful. When you open up enough to support heart awakening inside of you, all your mind wants to do is be of service to others, to help others, to be a benefit to others. It's beautiful. You haven't wasted your dollars. You haven't wasted your moments. You haven't wasted your minutes. You've created something precious. It's beautiful. And you're ready to die. You're ready to leave. It's okay. 